Tell us a story, the children begged the storyteller. Please, 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 they begged. Aishman, why don't you children go and play and let the storyteller rest his tired bones, chided the woman hanging out washing. Ah, leave them alone, Miriam. Children love stories. Remember how you used to beg for stories too? Now, what story should I tell you, huh? asked the storyteller with a twinkle in his eye. You have exhausted my bag of stories. Now I need to go and hunt for more. As they spoke, the very, very curious Thimby came out of the hut where he had been playing with ashes of the fire. He was covered in ashes and was an ashen white in colour. An ember had burnt him and tears ran down his face. Ha 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 ha! laughed the other children. He looks like a zebra. The storyteller scooped Thimby up in his arms and rocked him into silence. It's actually an honour to be called a zebra, he said. Why? asked the children in a questioning chorus. Let me tell you the story, said the storyteller. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, in the land of the Khoi, there lived a donkey called Concha. Concha's master was a great Khoi warrior called Thea. Thea was a great hunter and warrior who won many battles and hunted all the vicious animals that attacked the villages. <coughs> he had many things, but his prized possession was Concha. He loved her and treated her very well. She in turn served him well and he treated her with love and patience. Concha and her master worked very hard ploughing and farming the land together and he grew very, very wealthy. He bought many new donkeys but honoured Concha by allowing her to graze when all the, when, when, when all the others ploughed the new farms he had bought. This is the donkey that made me my fortune, he would proudly say to his visitors. And Concha used to beam. You should get a wife, the chief advised him. Yeah, 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 in due course he would reply smilingly. As time went by, Thea decided to get married. He married a girl from the northern village. Her name was Beta. Beta... Concha sensed, her name was Beta, Concha sensed that she did not love Thea but married him for his money. She hated Concha and was mean to her. Whenever Thea wasn't around, she would tell the servants to make Concha till the soil and work late into the night. Everyone was afraid of her. <coughs> she also had an evil-looking character who used to visit her regularly whenever Thea was away. He wore skins on his shoulders and had monkey's teeth around his neck. Everyone knew him. He was a witch doctor who used to cast spells on people and everyone lived in fear of him. He was evil, some people said. Whenever he came to the farm, the dogs would howl and the chickens would refuse to lay eggs. One day Concha was close to the kitchen window and she saw the witch doctor and Peter deep in conversation. The witch doc doctor kept looking around furtively. This raised Concha's suspicion. Why is he looking around so suspiciously? She thought to herself. She crept to the window. She crept closer and closer in order to hear what plot these two were hatching. If you give him the potion, then he will fall into a deep sleep forever, and we can take all the land and wealth, she overheard the witch doctor say. But you must give it to him exactly at exactly twelve o'clock when the moon is full. You must wait for the clock, the cock to crow the first time, then give it to him. But it must not be later than the second crow of the clock of the cock. If it is later, then the spell will not work and my power will be broken forever. 
Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. I knew one day you would make us rich. Ah, the witch doctor was her father. Why wasn't I surprised? Thought Concha to herself. They had the same mean glint in their eyes. How will we know what the rest of the plan is, Concha wanted. I will just have to follow them and see what they are up to. As Concha stepped away from the window, her hoof struck an empty pail that someone had left lying around. It clattered loudly into the night. Who's there? screamed Bita as she thrust her head out of the window. <coughs> Concha froze in her tracks, then realized that Bita could not see into the dark from the light. She carefully placed one hoof in front of the other and crept stealthily into the night. She breathed a sign of relief and hastened to the shed in case they came looking for her. She heard footsteps approaching and pretended she was asleep. She heard the sound of a bolt being shot. They had locked her in. Devils, she thought. She heard the footsteps retreat. She stood up wondering. How was she going to find out what these two were plotting? She walked over to the little window and stretched herself, hoping to she could climb out. The window was too high. She turned and sat on the floor, feeling despondent. How was she going to help, she wondered. She placed her head on her hoofs and settled down facing the door. For a long while she felt totally miserable. No, 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 no. She was not going to let this happen. <coughs> Bea had always taught her that nothing is impossible unless you let it be. Every problem had a solution. You just had to look for it. <coughs> she strode. She jumped to her feet and strode over to the locked door with, a, with renewed confidence. She inspect, inspected every inch of the door and frame. Aha! The frame was weak. She said to herself, I have strong legs. Haven't I ploughed the rough ground for years? She thought to herself. Peter, in forcing her to toil more than the others, had kept her super fit and her legs in top shape. She walked up to the door and began to kick it with her hind feet. She aimed her hoof at the, at the frame. With the last of a series of powerful kicks, the door came crashing down complete with the frame. She knew she could do it. Yes, 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 she said as she did a quick dance of triumph and dashed for the house. I hope I'm not too late, she thought to herself. The lights were still on in the main house and there were shadows moving within, and there were shadows moving within. Ah, the villains are still there, she said to herself with satisfaction. The lights went out and two shadows emerged from the darkened building and headed into the dark forest. Concha crept behind them, keeping them in sight, at the same time keeping herself hidden. In the distance, the owls were hooting and bats were flapping their wings, but she didn't care. The two shadows stopped at a very dark part of the forest and lit a fire. They danced around the fire, chanting and throwing some sort of powder into it. The flames grew so bright that they seemed alive and had eyes. The eyes seemed to stare at where she was, hiding in the forest. The smoke from the fire made her drowsy and the, eyes, and the eyes from the flames seemed to hypnotize her. She felt her eyelids, her eyelids grow heavier and heavier. Soon they closed and she just couldn't open them. She fell asleep. She jerked awake as the cock crowed. She shook her head trying to clear it. There were now three figures in the clearing. <coughs> Peter, the witch doctor, and the third figure was there. Thea looked different, almost as though he was asleep on his feet. He was in a trance. Drink, said Peter, holding out a goblet to Thea. The goblet emitted a green light and had smoke wafting out of it. No, mumbled Thea, no. 
Drink, I command you, bitter, screamed at him. He reached out slowly and took the, the goblet from her. He raised it to his lips. Drink, drink now. Drink before the cock crow, urged Peter's witch doctor father, hopping impatiently from one foot to the other. Peter took one sip of the goblet. Suddenly it was kicked out of his hand. Concha was there. She had managed to save, to wave, to manage to shake off the dizzying effect of the smoke and fire and rushed over to Peter. The goblet spun into the dark night, its contents spilling onto the leaves. The leaves turned a bright green and wilted instantly. The cock crowed for the second time. Pia fell to the floor. She was too late. He had already taken a sip of the potion. The two conspirators were enraged. Hit him with the poisoned whip, screamed the father. Peter reached into a bag and withdrew a seven-headed whip and stepped towards Tria, raising the whip. They were intent on killing him. She had to do something. She just had to. She threw herself over Tria. She felt a burning sensation on her back. The whip is poisoned, she thought fearfully. But still she covered her beloved master, shielding him with her body from the bite of the poisoned whip. The whip crackled against her skin in a frenzied rain of blows. She screamed with pain but still refused to allow them to hit Priya with the poisoned whip. The seven heads of the whip tore into her flesh and the poison flowed into her bloodstream. She lost consciousness. Priya awoke to the sounds of the cries. The workers had heard the screams and, and the now unconscious Priya and came to the to of the unconscious concha and came to the to investigate. The father and daughter escaped into the forest never to be seen again. Priya stood over the unconscious uh, concha looking down at her with love and sadness. She was frozen in a kneeling position exactly as she had been when shielding Priya. It was as though she had been turned to stone. She had sacrificed her life for him. She had saved him and she and he had to save her as well. He placed his hand gently on her chest. It was still. She had stopped breathing. What could he do? What could he do? What could he do? He wondered. Deep within him a voice said. The sacred stone. The sacred stone? Maybe. Just maybe. Legend had it that a wise man from ancient time had stood on the rock and delivered a message from the wise one in the sky to all the creatures in the world. In his message the legend went on. The messenger had said if anyone sacrifices themselves for another and asks no reward, the wise one will reward him themselves, shall reward them himself. Take her to the stone, commanded Priya, quickly. The workers took Concha, placing her on a stretcher and placed the stretcher on their shoulders. They walked in the dark to the sacred stone, with some lighting the way with burning torches from the fire. Everyone loved Concha. Some had tears in their eyes and others sobbed silently. They placed the, the frozen Concha before the stone. Thank you. Thank you. Please leave us, asked Priya gently. They all turned and, and left except for Kulani. She loved Concha a lot and was reluctant to leave. What if it doesn't work, she whispered tearfully. What if it doesn't work? Her voice trailed off into a tearful silence. Priya walked over to her and placed his hands gently on her shoulders. Everything is possible if you have faith. If you believe, he said, looking deep into her troubled, tearful eyes. Wh wh what? She began. Shh, said Priya, placing his fingers on her lips. Go and cry, cry no more. The wise one knows your pain, and he keeps his promise. Kulani turned and walked away, stopping only once to look back at Priya. At Leah and, and Concha. 
Priya looked both strong and vulnerable at the same time. He walked over to the fr frozen concha and gently ran his hand over her lacerated skin. The wise one knows your pain too, my friend, he whispered more to himself. And the silent night than anyone else. He fell on his knees, bowed his head and cried out to the wise one. O oh, wise one, you who have created the sun, the moon, the stars and even us fragile humans. You who have given us knowledge of the deserts, the secrets of our soul. Hear me. You have given me many things, but the thing I treasure most is the one that lies here before you, frozen in pain and death. You have sent a messenger to us, bearing tidings of those who make selfless sacrifice, and none on this whole planet, this whole world has made a more selfless sacrifice than this frozen creature before you. Concha is from your hands, and has heard your message. In her name and the name of the eternal truth, I throw myself before you and implore you. Please, honor and raise her. In raising her, others will know your truth and honor your name. Hear me, O wise one. Hear this miserable creature. Do not let the sacrifice go unheeded, I beg you. Priya sobbed his pain into the quiet night. There was no answer. Just stillness on the leaf, on the branch, a butterfly stared silently at him, as though waiting. He threw himself onto the ground and sobbed his heart out, covering himself with the ashes from the ancient fires. Hear me, hear me, he sobbed, his tears mixing with the ashes. His body was wracked with grief. There was just the stillness and an oppressive silence. It seemed to be pressing down on his eardrums. Perhaps the wise one had not heard his cry. Through his tear-filled eyes there seemed to be a growing light. Priya, Priya, son of the desert, a gentle voice said, Your plea has been heard in the sky and beyond the seven worlds. Rise to your feet. Priya slowly raised his eyes to the light. A shimmering figure stood on the rocket wall, flowing robe of pure light. The wise one never breaks his promise, and there is none more deserving than this creature, Concha. Truly you have been blessed by her presence. Priya was dumbstruck and couldn't speak. Take this and cover her with it, said the shimmering apparition. Let the promise of the wise one be kept. The air took the sparkling cloth and laid it over Concha. When he turned back, the figure had disappeared. But a beautiful aroma filled the air. The cloth began to grow brighter and brighter. Concha rose into the air covered in the glowing cloth. It grew so bright that the air fell to the ground in a swoon. He recovered later rubbing his eyes to clear them. Before him stood Concha. Concha! Concha! he said. But she looked different. She was covered in stripe. In stripes, all her wounds had been transformed into beautiful black stripes on her new white coat. She looked beautiful. Priya ran over to her and hugged her to him. The wise one said, this is my reward, said Concha with joy, and he named me Zebra, the daughter of courage. And you, Concha, are my reward, said Priya joyfully. He called everyone and they all marveled at Concha's new striped coat, especially Kolani. She couldn't keep herself from, from stroking it. They all lived happily ever after. So whenever you see a zebra, remember, the courage and selfless sacrifice of, of Concha. The storyteller looked around and all the children were asleep. He called Miriam and they carried the children off to bed one by one.